So it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome you all here this evening. My name is Michael Kennedy, uh, and we are extremely fortunate this evening to be able to host the Prime Minister of Kosovo, Alban Kurti. But we are also very fortunate to have all of you here with us today. So thank you for coming to Providence, and thank you for your engagement this evening. Thanks to the knowledge networks I have enjoyed in Kosovo, I have known Alban Kurti for over a decade. I have admired him for even longer than that. He may also be an inspiration for many of the students with whom I have worked over the years. Certainly after today's lecture, which is being recorded by the way, uh, he will be an inspiration for even more Brown University students to come. Alban Kurti is to be sure a great individual, but he is also part of a great generation of genuinely transformative, visionary Kosovar people. I have come to know many of these heroic women and men filled with great integrity and resilience. I would wish more folks like me could come to know more people of Kosovo. But Alban Kurti, if you don't know many Kosovars yet, is a great place to start. He was not only a fine student of computer science and telecommunications at the University of Pristina, but he also engages the arts. In many ways, from that alone, we can, say, we can see why his politics over the years has been so, I think you've even called it this, artful. One can appreciate his politics already during his days as a student activist, mobilizing nonviolent protest in 1997 against the Serbian occupation of university premises. When the war in Kosovo began in 1998, he joined the office of the general political representative of the Kosovo Liberation Army, led by Adem Demachi. Mr. Kurdi's memorial to that hero of Kosovo remains, to my mind, one of the most beautiful reflections, expressing reverence for a towering political figure with whom he shared most profound personal ties. Mr. Kurti remained in Pristina during that war until his arrest by Serbian forces on April 27, 1999. He was later taken to Serbian prisons, only to be released more than two years later. We still don't know the full toll of suffering endured by those imprisoned in this way. We also do not know the fates of 1,617 persons disappeared during this time. Prime Minister Kurti has prioritized learning their fates. As both a Prime Minister and as an activist, seeking justice has been Alban Kurti's mode of politics. Together with other figures from the Kosovar, or Kosovo Action Network, Mr. Kurti founded a movement, later a political party, called Ventavidosia, rendered in English as self-determination. The meaning of that name becomes even more clear when we know that Mr. Kurti was also imprisoned after the war by United Nations, European Union, and Kosovo Republic officials for his activism on behalf of his country's sovereignty, and I might add, also for his struggle against corruption. His party, Ventavidosia, realized something unprecedented in Kosovar history in February of 2021, when it won a majority of votes in the national election. And with that, we now have a prime minister, Alban Kurti. He has not become a leader in the simplest of times. You could have chosen your times more readily. 
After all, we suffer climate crisis intensifying and ecological insecurity growing, with pandemic overwhelming and well-beings of all sorts challenged, with inequalities magnified and struggles for the rights of the marginalized by necessity intensifying. And now, a war in Ukraine that hopefully moves solidarities among democracies ahead. I am very happy to see Kosovo led in such times by a person of such principle, such political imagination, such intellectual integrity. I am very glad and frankly honored to see Prime Minister Alban Kurti with us today. He will speak for about 15 minutes during our session this evening, but the great interlocutor that he is will take up the rest of the session with your questions. So be thinking about what you would like to know from this great transformative figure, intellectual and political leader. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Prime Minister Alban Corti. Dear Professor Kennedy, dear Michael, honorable members and guests of uh, Brown's distinguished academic community, ladies and gentlemen, it is both an honor and a privilege to speak to you today. This country has produced some of the most inspiring social movements in modern political history. From the 19th century abolitionism, and early feminism through the 20th century civil rights movement, and all the way to the present day struggles for equality and dignity. In addition, your home state of Rhode Island is also well known for its tradition of independence and dissent, having for its founder a dissident and free thinker like Roger Williams, who was banished from the Massachusetts Bay Colony for his vigorous defense of the liberty of conscience. Even closer to home, elite American universities, such as your own, have often been at the forefront of progressive social change. As someone who started his political activism as a university student, this is particularly apt venue for me to say a few words on the theme of uh, democracy and crisis. I was prompted into political engagement some 25 years ago by an unbearable sense of injustice. In the apartheid Kosovo of the 1990s, it was hard to be a human being and fail to be struck by a deep sense of indignation at what was happening. Though there was not much privilege to be had by any Kosovo or Albanian at uh, the time, even a slight degree of relative privilege made one feel socially responsible. As a university student with a middle-class background, I felt like I could not remain a bystander and still be able to look at myself in the mirror. And uh, so it began. I first joined the Student Independent Union of the University of Pristina, the student organization working to put an end to the appalling discrimination against Albanian students by Milosevic's regime. Soon thereafter, I was invited by the late Adem Democi, or Bozzi, as we in Kosovo would affectionately call him, to join him as an aide in his newly undertaken role as political representative of the Kosovo Liberation Army. I happily accepted the invitation. It's worth noting here that Democi was jumping into his new role after having served three prison sentences, which made for a total of 28 years spent in some of the most horrendous Yugoslav prisons. This first wartime foray of mine into political activism ended with my arrest by Milosevic's regime on April 27, 1999, one month into NATO's air campaign against Serbia. After more than two and a half years as a political prisoner, I was released in December 2001, having just come out of his third prison in 1990, Demochi remarked that he had been released from the small Yugoslav prison into the big prison called Kosovo. Open air, big prison, Kosovo. 
Following my own release from prison, I discovered instead that I had been released into one big hospital. I felt like Demoche's big prison had been replaced by the big hospital. Post-war Kosovo was reduced to what Giorgio Agamben has theorized as a state of exception, an undefined territory run by an unaccountable international administration that treated Kosovars like a bunch of patients without the capacity for self-determination. Once again, a sense of injustice would prompt me into political action. Together with a group of friends, some of them former political prisoners like myself, first Kosovo Action Network, and then in June of 2005, we founded the movement for self-determination, Levizia Vedvendosia. When I took back at, uh, when I look back at some of the key fe features of, the, of our political undertaking, two guiding ideas stand out to me as particularly noteworthy. First, action before organization. And second, reflective action directed at the structures to be transformed. Let me take each <coughs> in turn. We started engaging in acts of civil disobedience before we had a proper organization in place. The organization was an aggregate result of our actions, not their precursor. Our identity as a group was forged in collective actions, through which we would literally put our bodies where our words and convictions were. Such actions would sometimes involve symbolic infringements of law. This is just part of the definition of civil disobedience. For example, we would write political slogans on government buildings or on United Nations mission in Kosovo cars, on MiG cars. More importantly, we would also organize peaceful mass protests, thus declaring that we are not patients in a hospital, but rather free, self-determining agents. In so doing, we were claiming basic civil rights, such as the right of peaceful assembly, that the ruling ideology of the time was denying us. In this respect, we were just being good students of the history of liberation struggles throughout the world. Rights are not to be expected as a gift from the masters, rather they are to be taken from below by the subordinated. Freedom is to be understood as liberation. We become free only through choosing to act freely. Or as Immanuel Kant put it, we do not ripen to freedom other than through our own attempts, which we can make only when we're free. By putting action before organization, we're manifesting this fundamental truth of the history of social transformations. An additional virtue of this way of proceeding is that it safeguards us against the dangers of bureaucracy. A strong and rigid organization tends to stifle creative political action by shifting attention to offices and the distribution of power. As a result, instead of being through doing, characteristic of the vocation of the political activists, you get being through having. A bureaucrat has turf to defend and offices to keep. But as you've learned from your good professors, the more you have, the less you are. The other important aspect of our way of doing things was the insistence on reflective action targeting the structures to be transformed, what is sometimes referred to by the Greek word praxis. The emphasis here falls on reflective. Putting action before organization carries the risk of falling into the trap of actionism. That is mindlessly acting just for the sake of acting. The only way to protect against this vice is by institutionalizing thoroughgoing deliberation and radical self-critique. Thus, from day one, our movement tried to create an atmosphere of collective deliberation and inquiry in which there would be no sacred ideas or infallible personalities. If our action was to be successful at transforming society, we'd better make sure it was based on sound reasoning. 
And there is no better way to do that than by fostering a spirit of ruthless critique, including self-critique. So before our actions, we would always brainstorm proposals, vigorously argue for and against them, and call for a vote only at the very end. After the deliberative process had been thoroughly exhausted. Following our actions on the street, we would gather to reflect on what went wrong and what we could learn from the experience going forward. We tried to model our cyclical process of experiential, uh, experiential learning on the process of scientific inquiry. We would treat a new idea just like scientists treat a newly proposed explanatory hypothesis. That is, we would first subject it to the thoroughgoing critique, following which, and supposing the idea survived the initial screening for internal coherence and plausibility, we would test its external validity by experimenting with it out there in the public world. Of course, unlike scientific experiments, our actions had a significant moral dimension to them. They aimed to serve as a means for the people of Kosovo to acquire a critical awareness of their own condition. In this sense, our experiment were also exercised in critical pedagogy a la Paolo Freire. If a sense of injustice was what initially drove me to political activism, what guides me today as Prime Minister of the Republic of Kosovo is the ideal of good servant. The servant conception of leadership is hinted by the very Latin word that we commonly use to refer to a government department, that is ministry. To minister, from Latin, means to serve, which is to say that a minister is supposed to be a servant. From this, we can infer that my job description as Prime Minister is to be the chief servant of the Kosovar people. I have to say that I quite like what the Latin etymology suggests in this case. A servant conception of leadership reminds us that democratic representation should not be a contract of alienation. In a democracy, the people are not supposed to alienate their right to self-government to their elected leaders, but rather to delegate it. To be a faithful delegate is to be a good servant. A servant leader is humble and empathic, listens actively, engages directly with the people, and in general, aims to lead by example. While the roots of the different crises facing humanity today are many and varied, it seems to me that narcissistic and authoritarian leadership has something to do with our current global predicament. Perhaps then our world could make use of some servant leadership. Over the past year in government, I've been trying to live up to this demanding vision of leadership. My government has had to deal with many tough challenges all at once, including consequences of the pandemic COVID-19. And yet, despite all this, we managed to have an unprecedented economic growth rate of uh, double digit one, 10.53% of GDP over the last year, a significant part of which was fueled by people's greater trust in our government. Such a trust translated into greater investment, greater consumption, and greater tax revenue. This shows, it seems to me, that servant leadership pays off in tangible economic terms as well. Our landslide electoral victory on February 14, 2021, testified once again to the democratic spirit of our people. I believe this will contribute to the renewal of faith in the democratic process, not only in Kosovo, but across the region as well. The more democratic the societies of Western Balkans become, the greater the chances for long-term peace and cooperation between nations in our part of the world. In today's world, many are lamenting the current state of international politics, and rightly so. 
precisely when international cooperation and solidarity have become so essential to the survival of human civilization, it seems as though we've become least capable of it. Yet a crisis is by nature generous faced As the Greek roots of the word crisis reveal, it is a turning point in a disease yet pregnant with opportunity. Whether we make good or bad use of such opportunity is entirely up to us. Despair is not an option, especially not at this time of democratic backsliding, even in parts of the developed West. Right-wing authoritarian leaders are closely cooperating with one another across international borders. Not only should we Democrats do the same, but we should also do it more often and much better. We, uh, sorry, with democratic backsliding taking place against the backdrop of such great existential threats as climate change and nuclear war, the stakes are far too high for us to stand idle. International solidarity among all those committed to democracy is a must. United we stand, divided we fall. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Yes, okay. I'll stand on the other side. So, <clears throat> the Prime Minister has so graciously offered to spend most of the time fielding your questions, and he said to me upstairs that it's wide open. So it's not only based on what he had to say today, but about the state of the world, because clearly I would like to take inspiration for him for improving that state of the world. So with your questions, you might help guide it. Please, sir. Can you please the microphone to the online audience, please? Thank you. It is okay. I'd like to ask the question in opening first. Now it's on, I think. Um, uh, thank you for hosting the Prime Minister of Kosovo. Um, if it is okay, I'd like to ask the question in Albanian first, and then I'll translate what I just said in English. Uh, for us, for Albanians, uh, we talk Albanian to one another. Përshëndetje dhe mirë se ardhët në Boston dhe këtu, kisha një pytje specifike, ju keni vën agendën për të bërë kopshet që e ardhët edhe universitetet pa lek, por si mësues këtu në Amerikë, unë kam vërë reqë këtu kur aplikon në universitete në bazë të inkomave, dhe vendosin sa financial aid të japin këshu që në që ose prindit janë pasur paguan më shumë që ose janë më dvarë për paguan më pak qërë dhe tu janë skandal se kam një kolegi që paguan 2800 dolar për 3 fmi këshu që e vlerësoj që farë keni bërë po në aspekt në universitetit ju po kompromajs din në kualitet sepse universiteti Prishtinës në shumë deg në konkuron dot me universitetet e rajonet So I'll just translate what I just said. Um, I am a high school math teacher in uh, Boston, and I've uh, done my undergrad and master's degree here. I've been living here for 21 years, and I'm a member of the political party of Lovisia Vedendose. I had a specific question for the prime minister because I agree with a lot of his policies, but one of his policies, it was to make um, kindergarten and uh, pre-K free. Um, which uh, it is great because some families cannot afford and to make universities uh, free, but in that way they are, uh, uh, I feel that they are compromising in the quality. Whether in the United States, well, the pre-K here, and you know, it's ridiculous because I have a colleague that I work with that has three kids and she's paying $2,800 and she's crying, you know, when she pays that salary. So I really appreciate what the Prime Minister has done, but when it comes to university, um, by making it free for everyone, instead of the system here that we apply for FAFSA and based on your parents' income you pay, uh, you're compromising the quality and the University of Pristina and uh, other smaller universities that are public, they, they cannot compete in many, um, many fields with other universities because there's not enough budget going in. I, uh, you know, I apologize if I'm making the wrong as assessment. It should be more a question than a statement. But so, well, 
we'll take uh, three questions at a time, if that's all right. I should have said that earlier. Um, and we can bounce around. We don't have to follow necessarily. Um, thank you for uh, coming to speak at Brown University. Um, I had a question that was related to something you mentioned during your speech. Um, we saw a lot of um, countries in Europe, and especially in the Balkans, during the latest elections swing very far to the right. And then Kosovo did something that was very unparalleled and moved quite to the left. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak about your electoral strategy and what you think um, caused this uh, swing in Kosovo. Thank you. Thank you, Ersa. So I should say that Ersa is a concentrator in international and public affairs here at Brown University. So I'm very glad to have such a good question. One more, perhaps? Well, as you think of one more, maybe we can begin with these two. Um, first of all, it was our electoral promise that once we are in power, we're going to make public education free. We do not consider education to be a luxury. We consider it to be a right. We think that everyone who, who wants to study in the university should have that right. So we did it after we won. This was our promise. Uh, second, obviously, quality is not high. But uh, I don't think that impediment to increase quality is the fact that we made it free of charge. We are going to do a reform of education system. We are going to have more budget for R&D, but we do not want to increase quality at the expense of students. I know that students are not equal because the background of their family is different, but uh, we do not find it appropriate to make this differentiation at this point in time. Students who want to enroll university, we believe should have that right. And it was possible for us to do this also because of the economic growth that we brought. Exports in Kosovo increased by 83%. Foreign direct investments by 22%. Tax revenues by 34% without changing fiscal policy. I guess when people are hopeful, optimistic, they rather spend than save. Plus, when they see that there is no corruption in the government, they are more ready to pay taxes. Budget, annual state budget of Kosovo in this year increased by 26% in comparison with 2020. And we did not keep this growth for ourselves as a government or for the state of Kosovo. We distributed it. For example, we increased pensions by 11%, increased uh, pensions for the disabled by 33%, introduced uh, child and maternity allowances, increased budget for agriculture and defense, and also made university studies in public university free of charge. It was doable for us. So now we will need to increase the quality of our university but we thought that it is much better if we have this kind of equality at the onset. Not we are going to be equal at the very end. No, no, we have to start as equal. And this is also important in uh, normative and nominal aspect. So we, we started. Now we will have to uh, invest more. And one of the ways how we want to do it is by changing the law and the rules and the statute so our professors from diaspora can join our university. Because administratively, unfortunately, our university has fallen prey to bureaucracy. <laughs> and we all know how bureaucracy seeks self-perpetuation. They've written rules and statutes so they close the circle, and everyone who is new is seen as a danger rather than as a chance, as a danger for the administrative power within the university instead of seeing her or him as a chance for uh, 
progress in our university. So we will have to do a lot of changes in order to uh, <coughs> increase uh, uh, quality in our uh, university. Uh, regarding elections taking place, let's say, in the last decade, I think that what is going on in EU, and not only, is uh, an expression of the weakening of the middle class. Because center-left and center-right parties are generally a representation of middle class. With the weakening of the middle class, with the shift of the labor to far east or with the offshoring and outsourcing of uh, manufacture and industry in general, uh, we have weakened middle class and labor. And that's why the extremes got stronger. I think this is what we have seen in EU and perhaps at some extent also in US. Uh, our political movement won, I believe, because uh, we were very resilient, coherent, and insisting. And it paid off. So we never stopped. And I think that uh, this is what people evaluate most and respect most when you are insisting on your beliefs. And at the same time, you never get bitter or angry with people, even when they do not support you. You continue to work communicate, to cooperate, to render them active, to mobilize them, and so on and so forth. So this, I believe, helped us a, a great deal. And why we were uh, such a resilient movement, it comes from the belief in our convictions. Because uh, in politics, you cannot have only problem-solving approach. You must have certain convictions. Also, when you solve problems, you solve from a certain point of view. Also, when you criticize, you do it from a certain point of view. So politics end up, ends up in, in certain conviction. And this was uh, very strong in our case. And uh, in addition to perhaps other parties, which might have been also resilient, but did not win, is because we engaged in struggle, public action, direct action. We did not wait to form an organization with structures in order to say something or act. Uh, we were forged in struggle. So in a way, convictions and struggle went hand in hand. And they've built us uh, for challenges ahead and for final victory. So I think this was very peculiar uh, with our movement. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Right over here on the left, please. The, the woman in front and then the gentleman behind. Yeah, I think that works. Okay, hi, I'm Anna. I'm a Master of Public Affairs candidate here at Brown University and I'm from Germany. And in light of the current events, I would be wondering what is your stand or your country's stand towards the European Union, and do you think your country will submit an application to NATO anytime soon? Please, back. Yeah. Um, I'm from, I'm Zlatko Salak-Lagunja from Bosnia-Herzegovina, and I would like to ask you one question, one related topic to it. The question is, uh, Eddie Rama's party in Albania recently didn't put to vote the resolution of Srebrenica, and I know that your position and Kosovo's position is to accept that the genocide happened. And secondly, what do you think needs to happen, like what do you mean by democratization, that needs to happen for us in the Balkans to go from a conflicting, where we're trying to engage in conflict with one another, with one another to cooperation with each other? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have one more before we? This is a, a party of twos, I can <laughs> see. So, Mr. Prime Minister, please. Um, 
First of all, I think that European Union is the most important historical process and political project of peace and prosperity since the Second World War. And uh, EU had three important pillars. First is peace through anti-fascism. When uh, Robert Schuman on 9th of May 1950 uh, made his declaration, which is today Days of Europe, he did it on the fifth anniversary of victory over Nazi Germany, over fascism. So peace through anti-fascism. Perhaps in contrast to Neville Chamberlain in Munich Conference 1938, appeasement of fascism. So peace with fascism brought Second World War. Peace through anti-fascism is one of the pillars of EU. So this is the first pillar. Second pillar is continental European welfare state, where economic growth is not enough. You need social justice. And social justice is social insurance plus progressive taxation. So second pillar is continental European welfare state. And third pillar is uh, NATO security umbrella. EU had NATO. That's why it could flourish and defend its progress. No wonder that nowadays EU members are wanting to become NATO members, namely Sweden and Finland. So far, we have had some NATO members who wanted to join EU, for example, Turkey. But now we have EU members who want to join NATO, like Finland and Sweden. We will apply to join both EU and NATO. But to that end, we have first to become part of Partnership for Peace program of NATO. That's the first milestone. And we have already applied for Council of Europe. Uh, let's see how the Paris summit will develop in late June. We want to integrate into EU because we consider that uh, uh, EU is our destiny, Europe is our continent. And in this way, by joining EU, uh, it will be better for both for a country which joins and for the EU which enlarges. So to link it with the other question, I believe that the entire Western Balkans should join EU. And I think this depends at large extent from the new kickstart of Berlin process, Berlin process 2.0, let's call it, which I think should bring common regional markets but which needs a recognition at least of documents from Kosovo by Serbia. Currently, Serbia does not recognize any documents of Kosovo. For example, if you want to go with your passport to Serbia, at the border crossing, they will confiscate your passport and you might even get arrested. If you show your ID card, they suck your bio data from there and then they give you a piece of paper in, in which it is written that you've lost your old ID, Serbian ID from 1999, even though you might have not been born then. So there are such absurdities. Or, for example, if you fly to Pristina airport and you want to go to Serbia, they don't let you in because they consider that landing as illegal entrance to Serbian territory. So I believe these things have to end. It is doable because Slovakia, Greece, Romania do recognize my passport, but not my country. So there is this space in which Serbia can walk, but does not want to. It is possible. So common regional market, Berlin process 2.0, I think is a nice step towards EU where we could use the model of EFTA-EEA, economic 
uh, European Economic Area, uh, European Free Trade Agreement, similar to what Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Switzerland have. For example, part of EEA were Austria and Portugal before joining EU. So as a preparatory phase for joining EU, I believe that um, Berlin Process 2.0 modeled upon EFTA EEA with a joint council and committee with a court based on EU values and uh, uh, with a overview authority because there can be setbacks as well uh, is the right way forward. So to conclude, I think that EU should be homegrown yet not self-made. It cannot be self-made. We need help from outside. But it should be homegrown. It cannot be imported. And when I say EU values, again, I mean rule of law, democratization, dealing with the past, freedom of the press, and uh, social justice uh, as something which is necessary for every economic uh, growth. Uh, there has been some internal disputes between uh, government and opposition in Albania. And I think that uh, a resolution on Srebrenica genocide uh, has fallen prey to that. So I hope that on 11th of July, government will pass such a resolution. And uh, the real test will be in a more or less month and a half. And uh, hopefully uh, that will uh, also be approved. And uh, regarding Western Balkan 6, one last thing. Six countries altogether are 18 million people, which is population-wise the size of Netherlands. GDP-wise, it is the size of Slovakia. So I was telling to my German and French friends and colleagues in politics and diplomacy, bail us out, bring us in. Because it is not a big burden for EU. Internal consolidation and reforms of EU should not hinder external enlargement. Western Balkans is in Europe. With the inclusion of Western Balkans into EU, it is EU which becomes Europe. And for approximately 2,000 miles, the external border of EU would get smaller, which is also from the security perspective better. But where I, in this quest for EU, where I have a stark contrast with some of the other leaders in the region, is that I never get cynical or bitter towards EU. I am very critical towards EU, but I think we have no other alternative. We should get inside EU and make it better. Turn it into a rather social Europe. And the critique I learned from them, it is the Europe which learned me to do the critique against Europe while saying that there is no alternative but Europe. So not cynicism and bitterness. Because we have some leaders in the region who say, if EU is not taking us this year, I might check for some other alternatives. And that is really harmful. And at the same time, uh, it's not bringing benefit to anyone. So when EU is not showing much of, let's say, trust in us people of Balkans, rather than being angry, I get a bit sad. Because the lack of trust of EU into the Western Balkan 6 usually is an expression of the lack of self-confidence. So I would like EU to have more trust in itself. And consequently, it will have more trust in us. So when sometimes they say, no, 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 we are not going to enlarge. This is not that they simply do not believe in us or don't trust us. But they lack the necessary self-confidence in the times that we live in. So when you hear any European leader saying, no, 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 we should not take Georgia, Moldova, Western Balkans, or Ukraine for that matter, that does not mean necessarily that they think bad of Ukraine. 
but they lack self-confidence. That's why in these kind of situations, I get rather sad than angry. More questions? So let's do a first round to make sure that people who haven't spoken have a chance. So let's go over to the other gentleman, or the other person in a brown sweatshirt. Um, you know what to wear in order to get called on early. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in. I'm Nicholas, I'm a senior here. Um, and as others have mentioned, there's been this kind of rise in populism and that leads to a lot of nationalism among a lot of European leaders and countries. Um, and in some ways it looks like there's kind of a lack of faith or a lack of interest in engaging with kind of European institutions as a result. Um, and when we've seen kind of with the Ukraine crisis, there's been this renewal of some level of European unity and spirit. And I was kind of wondering if you think that unity is hopefully gonna persist after um, for years to come, or if we're going to see kind of this re-rise in nationalism that we were seeing in the years prior to Ukraine. Good. Then there's a gentleman here, yes. Thank you. Hi, um, Prime Minister, thank you for joining us. My name is Felipe, and I'm a senior here at Brown um, from Panama. My question for you is, what is your administration's plan to address um, brain drain in Kosovo and the large number of doctors leaving the country in particular? Good, thank you. And then Mark Suchman, please. Hi, I'm Mark Suchman. I'm a faculty member here in sociology. And I'll sort of piggyback on, on the question about, uh, another question about the EU, which is, yep. although it's easy to idealize the EU, when you were talking about you know, creating organization versus creating action, the EU is at least, you know, my perception of it, you know, not famous for being non-democratic and bottom up, right? And I'm wondering, sir, when you think about the EU and about Kosovo's role in the EU, or your know, potential position in the EU, um, you know, are there ways to make the EU itself a more responsive democratic organization or entity, given its scope across Europe and across many different you know, national entities and so on? And so I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on that. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me s start by saying that if we lose EU, God forbid, no EU country can come out victorious. Because destroying EU is a plan of a superpower from Northeast. It doesn't come from EU itself. So I know that there are some populist leaders in EU who think that by weakening EU, or perhaps even ruining it, their nation will benefit. That is very naive. We live at times when EU needs US and US needs EU. I do not recall any other moment when US and EU needed more each other than now. So I believe in transatlantic, and I dislike anti-European Americans and anti-American Europeans. I think that's very short-sighted. It could be interesting to be in any of these groups, but interesting doesn't mean good nor helpful. Regarding populism, uh, I will be a bit provocative. Also, democracy has something populistic with it, you know? One person, one vote has a bit of a flavor of populism. Because what does this mean? This means that when we vote, we vote as bodies. Each one of us here has her or his own body. As bodies, we go to vote. We're not voting as minds, because if in this room we are 40 people, here are 40 bodies, but not necessarily 40 minds. Some of our minds are very alike, right? So we go to vote as bodies. And there is a like certain populism inherent within democracy, electoral democracy, as we know it. However, I would here recall one uh, very good French philosopher who passed away a few years ago, 
Jean-Luc Nancy, he says that populism is the way in which democracy takes revenge for its own failure. So populism is the way in which democracy takes revenge for its own failure. So before populists winning, beforehand something has gone wrong. Utter alienation, destruction of middle class, suppression of labor in favor of capital, and so on and so forth. So we should not just judge populism. We should be responsible enough and smart enough to discuss why this did happen, not only to take it as a given fact, as a face value, with which we deal in symptomatic level. And uh, what can save us from populism, I believe, is uh, uh, some sort of class analysis. Populists consider that people are an organic totality. I don't think so. People are united when they protest, when they demonstrate, when they do uprising. That is people united. But other than that, you have population, you have society, you have the rich, you have the middle class, you have the poor, you have the labor, you have the owners, you have the migrants with or without papers. So society is much, much more heterogeneous. And this kind of analysis helps us not to fall prey to populism. And I think that best critique that we can do is precisely this, a refusing, a rejecting, uh, organic uh, <coughs> viewpoint on people. Uh, what to do in EU at these times? I think that pan-European movements and organizations <coughs> are needed besides institutions. We have pan-European institutions, but we need pan-European organizations and movements. And these would come from below. Whereas pan-European institutions generally come from above. It is very difficult to make pan-European organizations, but I think that is a very noble task and uh, perhaps the only way. Uh, regarding brain drain, uh, when United Nations Mission in Kosovo got established in 1999, they told us, you do not have diplomas. You do not have qualifications. You have high unemployment, but what is worse, you are unemployable because you do not have any degree. And then, in order to have investments from abroad, we were supposed to get diplomas, to get degrees, to get qualifications, so we become attractive for foreign investors. This is how we have been told after liberation. And uh, just as we generally didn't have university qualifications, we started to have two or three diplomas each citizen. Universities and colleges emerged like mushrooms after spring rain. <laughs> and there was this inflation of colleges and universities in Kosovo. And we started to wave our diplomas in the air for the airplanes of foreign direct investment to land in our country so they employ us because we became employable. But they did not stop. What we have gotten was brain drain. Those who were with our diplomas of our universities left. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And we got this brain drain. So what is the lesson that we should learn? When it com comes to job and education, they are not in the relation, they are not in diachronic relation when it comes to people, to society. So first, you do the education, and then you get a job. 
No, because if you think that first you have to do the education in order to get a job for the entire nation, you get brain drain. The best leave. So what is valid for an individual is not valid for society. Yes, as individual, we first do the studies and uh, uh, we learn and then we go to uh, get a job. But in case of society, these, there must be a synchronic relation between the two, not diachronic relation. Hand in hand, jobs and education. You have to link these two. And I think Germans do this best. They have the dual education system. And they don't think of education without thinking about economy. And they don't think about economy without thinking of education. So the, the ultimate wisdom about economy is education. And the ultimate wisdom about education is economy. And I think that's, uh, that's what should have been done two decades ago. But here we are now. What I'm doing is that uh, I'm trying to open independent state agencies, publicly owned enterprises, municipalities, government, managements and boards of directors for our professionals who are abroad. And I'm not calling them for a mandatory military service, but for a voluntarily civil service from six months to two years. All of them, whoever wants to come to Kosovo, will find something to help us with the worth ethics, with the work ethics uh, in our country, with their know-how, with their knowledge, with their skills. And uh, uh, likewise, I'm trying to make sure that uh, we do the reform of education. So for diplomas of our universities, we have jobs in labor market. There are so many students in uh, Kosovo, sorry to take this example now, but who have master degree in sociology, but <laughs> they work as waiters in cafeterias and in restaurants. So that's why they say that perhaps uh, Pristina is the place with best macchiatos, because they are with master <laughs> degree in sociology. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, we are trying to make sure that uh, uh, we're not going to continue down the same path where, for example, uh, thousands of students per year graduate law. What to do with thousands of students who graduate law every year, for example, or economics in general. And we want to change this. We have given, for example, a lot of scholarships for IT sector information technology. But there, we privileged women. Because you, we have this other phenomena where men are studying IT, and women, after graduation, are going into public sector, and there is a huge discrepancy in salaries, where men get 10 times more than women. So there is nothing manly about natural sciences and technology. And uh, we've given most of our scholarships for IT sector to uh, female students. Some of my best friends are sociologists in Pristina, so please know <laughs> that uh, this is not a setup by any means. Um, do we have any other comments or questions? Please, Saida and then Rachmana. Or, well, you have them. Yeah. Um. Is it open? Okay. So, uh, yeah, my name is Sayada. I am uh, one of Michael Kennedy's students, PhD candidate in sociology here. <laughs> 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 and uh, to be honest, I was really blown away by listening to you because when we hear that, okay, a politician is coming to talk at the university, like you, you get a certain idea, but like your work, your words were highly intellectual, very engaging. I really, really enjoyed it. My question is something that I, is, is a type of question that I don't love asking, but I'm asking you because I think that you probably have a view on the situation that many of us don't. 
And my question is, do you see the Russia-Ukraine war to be a prolonged war, or do you think it will be ending in the short to medium term? Uh, do you also see it expanding in other countries or not? Like, what's your assessment of it? I know nobody can predict the future, but maybe you can give us some yes. um, yeah, your viewpoints. Thanks. Hi, my name is Archana. I'm a sociology PhD student. So maybe my macchiatos are even even better. I don't know. Um, but you, so you, I mentioned uh, your emphasis on social justice a number of times, and I'm curious to hear from you what other sort of policy uh, aims you have in the coming years on that front. Uh, you mentioned education, free education, and um, pension redistribution, but I'm just I'm curious to hear what, what you are planning. There are more sociologists in the room, but since my question is following, not surprisingly, the other sociologists in the room who are speaking, uh, may I ask you, Mr. Prime Minister, when we were together in Pristina last November, we were already anticipating the Alliance of Democracies, because President Biden was already talking about that. But this was before the war. So how has the prospect for meaningful alliance of democracies changed with this war? And has the sense of democracy itself that motivates an alliance changed, mm. building on both Archana and Sayeda? Yes. Um, uh, if I may say just one more word about uh, populism, because I forgot from the same author, Jean-Luc Nancy, he uh, says that... Uh, the difference between democratic political parties and proto-fascist, because what, that's what they are, you know. These populist parties, they flirt with fascism. Fascism is not reserved for Germany and Italy between two world wars or for Pinochet's Chile half a century ago. Fascism is a plague that can fall upon any nation or state, but you have to be careful. It's not reserved for certain nations. And today, I believe, we are witnessing Russian fascism. This is what I see today. We can discuss about this, but uh, we can call it imperialism, we can call it uh, aggression, invasion, and so on, but basically, this is Russian fascism. And if you see the intellectuals behind Putin, it gets ever clearer. From Ivan Ilin, at the beginning of 20th century to Alexander Dugin uh, recently. Alexander Dugin, who is a right-wing Heide Heideggerian. You know, he's in love with Dasein. You know, right-wing Heideggerian, that's what he is. So, uh, uh, in fascist parties, they consider that they are the truth. And democracy is a, is a means to power, not a value for society. Therefore, they consider that they are the ultimate truth and they just have to go through the process of electoral democracy to prove what they knew from the very beginning, that they are the truth. So for them, democracy is completely instrumental. They don't believe in it. They consider democracy as a hammer with which you nail down things. So this is, from their perspective, cycles of democratic elections. Whereas for democratic parties, democracy is a value in which they believe. And democracy is fragile because it has a certain uncertainty. We do not know the result. And we have to cohabitate with this fragility, with this uncertainty. Then we are democratic. If we are brave enough to cohabitate, to coexist with uncertainty, we are Democrats. If we are not brave enough to cohabitate with uncertainty, but we consider ourselves to own the truth, basically, if we are cowards, we become fascists. This is what uh, is uh, my elaboration using Jean-Luc uh, uh, Nancy. So... Uh, Regarding Russia-Ukraine uh, 
war in one hand is invasion and aggression. On the other hand is liberation struggle. I believe that this is going to define not only democracy as we know it or security in Europe, but future of the world. I dare say that future of the world will be decided with the outcome of this war. And uh, I read last year, a few months after it was written, a text, 5,000 words, by despotic President Putin. Uh, I don't know if you've read that text, which says that Ukrainians and Russians are one and the same people. So he denies the existence of the other. When I read that text, for me it was clear. There is no peaceful solution. And it is interestingly that he mentions Kosovo there as well in one paragraph. He says, Ukraine was doing fine as long as it had good relations with Russian Federation. But now, after they've ruined the relations with us, their GDP per capita is at the level of Moldova, Albania, or non-recognized Kosovo. Mm -hmm. You know, Moldova, Albania, non-recognized Kosovo. So, he recalls centuries 9 and 12 to explain 21st century. Typical prince of darkness with the cynicism of Catherine the Great. You know that old saying of Catherine the Great that she said that the only way how I can defend borders is by pushing them further. I don't, I don't know how to defend borders otherwise. This kind of cynicism, you know, like expansionism. But it has some historical objective conditions, I must say. In a century and a half, approximately and averagely, each year, Russian Empire was expanding by around 15,000 square miles. Can you imagine that? 15,000 square miles, which is like the territory of Kosovo and Albania together. Or if you could compare here with Rhode Island or with Massachusetts, which part, I don't know, know which is. It's 15,000 15, uh, square miles each year, averagely, was expanding for 150 years. So there is a kind of a historical build-up. It's not that simple. So in one hand, yes, I agree with Immanuel Kant. Generally, democracies do not fight each other. Perpetual peace, which was written almost 230 years ago. If Russia would have been a democracy, there wouldn't have been an invasion in Ukraine. I fully agree. But still, I'm tempted to say that I do not see that Putin and Kremlin are the only problem. There are some underlying historical currents to what we see nowadays. That's why I don't think that this war will end this year. One other political reason why this war I do not think will end this year is the fact that Russia is waiting for the harsh winter to divide EU upon rising prices of Russian gas. They are looking forward to this. Another element which shows me that they are planning to divide EU is the fact that in Sweden, bless you, in Sweden, two citizens, one of them I heard from Denmark, burned down Quran, holy Islamic book. They burned down Quran. And then some Muslims were burning down cars in Sweden, just like they did in suburbs of Paris some years ago. And later on, it was found out that those who burned Quran were admiring Putin. So now, Putin will try fascists in Europe to do things against Muslims, so Muslims strike back, and use this for further disunity within EU. Because it is in the interest of Putin that people like Marie Le Pen win, ele in, win in elections. So they will be engaging in this.
this. And no wonder that some right-wing populists are not really condemning Russian aggression and invasion. Moldova, Georgia are at risk, and Western Balkans. Six. I think Western Balkans is at risk because of Republika Srpska and because of Serbia. Serbia has 14 MiG-29 fighter jets, eight of them donation from Belarus and six from Russian Federation. There is an office of Ministry of Defense of Russian Federation inside the Ministry of Defense of Serbia in Belgrade. They have 100 miles from my office in Niš, a so-called humanitarian Russian center with dozens of agents, spies. They buy armament from China. They buy armament from Russian Federation. And they have had 104 joint military exercises last year. In 2012, only two joint military exercises between Serbia and Russian Federation. 2016, 50. Last year, 104 out of 91 which were planned. The two most notable being Slavic Brotherhood and Slavic Shield. I was joking with one of my ministers, should we do Illyrian defense? No. These guy kind of pre-modern tribes now. We're going back there with modern technology, you know, pre-modern, pre-modern tribes and modern technology, you know. So uh, we are worried because there are 48 forward operation bases around the border of Kosovo. Each one of them has 50 to 150 soldiers. Kosovo is not in NATO, but NATO is in Kosovo. Kosovo is not in EU, but the EU is in Kosovo. I don't think the chances to us, for us to be attacked are very high, but you never know. I remember very well when former President George W. Bush invaded Iraq. In Serbian media, they were writing, if U.S. goes after Iran, that will be our window of opportunity to occupy back Kosovo. Because they they want to see diversion of U.S. attention in some other conflict and then to attack you. Because if you recall the history of Second World War and First World War, a lot of things happen like this. When a certain power is focused somewhere, this creates a vacuum in some other region. And we are worried, we are vigilant, but not afraid. And uh, we are looking forward to cooperate more with the United States to uh, ensure security and defense of our republic. And this is one of the goals why I came this time to U.S. In uh, 10 days, I've been into eight states, uh, two more to go. And then I fly back on Sunday afternoon. I ask for investments to Kosovo by Albanian American diaspora and Albanian and American businessmen, but also we discuss security uh, issues. Uh, Putin mentions us every other day. Every day, Putin, Zaharova, Sergei Lavrov, or Medvedev, they mention us. Why they do so? Because Putin believes that NATO intervention in Kosovo in spring 1999 is the most important singular event of international relations since the fall of Berlin Wall. Very much preoccupied with that. And uh, on 25th of November last year, President of Serbia, Vucic, met Putin for the 19th time in Sochi, in the Russian Federation. And in that meeting, last year, you can find an internet quotation, Vucic saying that he spoke about international hypocrisy and President Putin understands that very well, but he was asking for additional explanations. And to that, Vucic responded, by talking about north of Kosovo and showing him on the map. Two weeks after that meeting, 8th of December last year, President Putin appoints as deputy 
Minister of Defense, certain General Mayor Yevkurov from the Republic of North Ossetia. So he is number two now in Russian, in Russian army. He has survived two assassination attempts in Chechnya, and he fought also in 2008 on the occasion of the annexation of South Ossetia and Abkhazia in Georgia. But you know why is this guy more famous in the Balkans? Because on the eve of 11th of June 1999, he brought 200 soldiers, Russian soldiers, from Bosnia and Herzegovina to Pristina airport to outpace NATO. And Wesley Clark almost hit, has hit on them, but Sir Michael Jackson, British general, did not listen to the American one, and somehow some modus vivendi was found. And this general, who was a young officer back then, now is number two in the Russian army. Shoigu, Minister of Defense, is more of a strategic person, and he is more operational, uh, Yevkurov. And I asked my cabinet uh, ministers whether they can remember if Putin ever visited Kosovo. They were trying to guess. Putin did visit Kosovo. I was in Serbian prison, 17th of June 2001, on the occasion of second anniversary of the arrival of Russian troops to Pristina airport, he came to Pristina airport. So, remember when he said, if NATO, NATO can fake genocide, why they are complaining about Donbass and Crimea? So basically he admitted that there is no genocide in Donbass and Crimea, but he wants to mimic, to do a mirroring of NATO intervention in Yugoslavia. And there are many journalists who say that, well, NATO intervened against Yugoslavia to liberate Kosovo, so Putin intervened against Ukraine to liberate Donbass and Crimea. Well, wait a minute. In case of Russia, that's a one-man show. In case of NATO, spring 1999, 19 countries, democratic countries, got together to bombard one country. It must have been very bad. 19 countries don't get together that easy. So they got together in spite of the opposition and democracy, and they uh, bombarded uh, Milosevic regime, Yugoslavia and Serbia of, of, of that time. So all these false analogies are, are very problematic. Putin considers that US and NATO failed in Iraq, failed in Afghanistan, they should fail in Kosovo. He likes to see Kosovo as a temporary NATO success. That's why it is not only NATO which defends Kosovo, also Kosovo defends NATO, because it defends the narrative of a successful democratic military intervention to stop genocide, to help people whose human rights are being severely violated, where you have crimes against humanity and, uh, and war crimes. I would just like to share with you one more thing. I've read recently an interview by Sergei Karaganov. He is the former advisor to Putin. A very scary interview with three interesting elements in it. Number one, he is asked by the journalist, why do you want to occupy Ukraine? They hate you. You're not going to be able to rule over them. How do you plan to do it? Let's say you occupy Ukraine. Next day, how do you plan to run the country? They hate you. And he said, you know what he said? He said, uh, well, Chechens hated us very much. So after four or five years of war, now Chechens are the best troops of Russia in Mariupol. Mercenaries. Or Eastern Germans. They were so much against Russia. But five to six years after World War II, they were the most pro-Sovietic nation. It takes a lot of victims, devastation, and efforts for that matter. So how can you think like this? So they are thinking that, okay, you hate them now, but in four to five years, 
you're going to change your mind. Because they're going to bomb you. They're going to shell you. They're going to loot you for four or five years. If you manage to survive, you will go deaf from explosions. Because they have one century of collected ammunition from Soviet Union. And they are just throwing now at people. Because here, among my American and European friends, I have a slight critique. We all enjoyed the failure of Russian blitzkrieg. And I think that the Russian blitzkrieg has failed. But you have 12 million refugees in Ukraine this day. Six million left the country. Six million are internally displaced people. And millions of lost jobs. So while we slightly celebrate failure of Russian army, we neglect two elements. The severe consequences on one hand and the fact that the war is not over. So I worry about my country not just because it's my country, but also because if Russia starts new conflict in Moldova or Georgia, they would have to allocate a portion of their military power to these new battlegrounds. Whereas in case of Kosovo or Bosnia and Herzegovina, they could outsource it to Serbia and Republika Srpska. So it's going to be easier for them. It's going to be like added value to their conflict-driven logic. Uh, and uh, I still believe that uh, Berlin and uh, Washington, D.C., with two prominent social democrats who have very clear stance on Russian aggression and invasion are the right way forward to lead in this decade. I think they could do more, better, faster, but I'm not there to know all the complications. And I can see also certain nuances and cracks within the Western democracies which worry me. And what worries me most is when Berlin and Paris are not on the same page. When Berlin and Paris are not on the same page, then Europe is at danger. So I wish I could see in the weeks and months to come more coordination between uh, Berlin and uh, Paris. And uh, uh, since uh, many students of sociology, I think sociology is very important. I read, I read, I read Pierre Bourdieu in prison. He is what, he is my fam uh, favorite sociologist, you know. Uh, and uh, because I, you know why I, I like sociology very much, I like sociology very much because I think political science is not enough. <laughs> you know, we have we have a lot of political science today, but I think it's not enough. Sociology is, is needed. And I was lucky to get this book of uh, Pierre Bourdieu in prison to read it. And in the beginning, uh, this Pierre Bourdieu I did not read in Serbian prison, but in Kosovo prisons later on as a political activist. Because in Serbian prisons, they did not let me have to have books for six months. And after six months, you know what did they do to me? They allowed me to read only Russian authors because they wanted to humiliate me. And I read all of Dostoevsky there and, Tol and Tolstoy and Turgenev and... Uh, Pushkin and uh, you know and uh, I was uh, uh, careful enough not to show any uh, sign of being happy to get those books <laughs> <laughs> so because these are great books but they in their mind they were they wanted to humiliate me with Russian authors and what I remember there is that I read them in Serbian like translated I remember that in the introduction like afterward and so on of these translated novels I remember one of the uh, Serbian authors writing how Sergei Yesenin sounds better in Serbian than in Russian. You know, it's like there are some also some deep cultural links which in these dark times uh, get strengthened. You know, all these people who, all these Serbs who want to be more Russian than Russians and these Russians who want to be more Serbs than Serbs and who find cultural links and they are not... They are not uh, mediocre people. They are not average people. They are intellectuals, and they become part of the problem. 
sorry, because I was wondering a bit. <laughs> but this may be a terrific moment for us to conclude the official gathering. But let me just say that I, I began to be confused, because I didn't know whether to say thank you to Prime Minister Corti or thank you to Professor Corti, because he exemplifies both and takes, and we all take inspiration from that. So thank you so much for joining us.